God designed these creatures to have this powerful desire to relate to us. Well, likewise, we are created to have a powerful desire uh, to relate to God. Sin gets in the way, of course, uh, but nevertheless, uh, there is that spirit uh, component to us. So we are the only species, according to the Bible, that wonders about what's coming after we finish this life. Uh, the soulish creatures, according to um, Ecclesiastes, when they die, they go to the dust. Incidentally, that's one of the uh, points we get criticized a lot for in the Christian community, this idea that dogs won't go to heaven. And incidentally, we're not saying there aren't dogs in heaven, just that it's not going to be the dogs we had here on earth. Uh, they go to the dust. Uh, only the spirit creatures are eternal. When God creates them, they last forever. That's why I also believe that there won't be annihilation, uh, that even the condemned uh, will continue to live for all eternity. Uh, that which is spiritual is eternal. But if you wanted to disprove the Christian faith, just prove that there is no such thing as a separate uh, attribute of the human species, a relative other species. That's exactly what the atheists are trying to do. They're trying to demonstrate that we differ with respect to the other animals only by degree, not by unique attribute. So this is a critical point where we can put different creation models to the test. Uh, but one of the things we've done at Reasons to Believe, and this will be published in this book, Who is Adam?, is to try to look at the Genesis genealogies and calibrate them. You know, and I've talked this over with a number of uh, Hebrew scholars and uh, systematic theologians, and what I notice is there's a consensus amongst these theologians that there are gaps in the genealogies. Even the younger creationist theologians can see that there must be gaps in the genealogies. The big debate is how many. Young earth creationists argue there's only a few gaps. Some old earth creationists argue for a lot. Well, one of the things we tried to do is to settle this debate over how many gaps by trying to calibrate the one genealogy in the Bible where I think you can do that, and that's Genesis 11. And that's the genealogy that takes you from Noah down to Abraham. Well, we have a good historical date for Abraham. Uh, you can get a historical date by looking at the biblical chronology, uh, but today we have the archaeological evidence to independently establish an historical date for Abraham. Abraham's name now shows up in a number of archaeological finds. Uh, in either case, you come up with a date that he was on the planet about 4,000 years ago. So he would have been in an active uh, state at that time. But as you read down the genealogy, uh, you notice that halfway down the genealogy, exactly halfway down, you have this gentleman named Peleg. Now, if you go back one chapter, Genesis 10, verse 25, it tells us that the world was divided in the days of Peleg. And there's been quite a bit of discussion over exactly what that text means. But I think today we have the scientific insight to appreciate uh, that, what that verse is really all about in the sense that we notice in the beginning of Genesis 11 uh, that God is emphasizing once again the need for humanity to become globally occupying the planet. And in fact, what we notice in the first nine chapters of Genesis is that God is repeating the command he gave in Genesis 1 in the beginning of Genesis 9. Now, he says to Noah, I want you and your descendants to multiply and fill the earth. When we come to Genesis 11, the human species is still resolutely disobeying that command. Let us build a city and a tower so we can remain as one people in one place and not be scattered over the face of the earth. But God supernaturally intervenes and scatters humanity forcibly over the whole uh, face of the earth. Uh, but there's one thing blocking uh, that uh, forcible migration. And uh, that's the fact that the Bering Land Bridge is cold. Uh, while we have new evidence that demonstrates that the Bering Land Bridge warmed up just before it broke. And so there is a narrow window of time, less than 3,000 years wide, where we've got a bridge joining Siberia uh, with Alaska. And the bridge is about 500 miles wide, so it's not a narrow bridge. It's a big, wide bridge. Uh, but until 14,000 years ago, it was much too cold uh, for easy human migration. Uh, but starting 14,000 years ago, the Ice Age was now well receded, and that whole Bering Land Bridge warmed up. In fact, it was considerably warmer than it is today, 
average temperature of 56 degrees. And uh, scientists uh, recently, two years ago, uh, recovered food grains all across the Bering Land Bridge and were able to carbon-14 date those grains. And they come in at about 12 to 13,000 uh, years ago. And also, we can document all along the coast of British Columbia where you got all those islands and the mainland and all down through Alaska and the Bering Land Bridge, you can document the rise of sea level. And uh, what these oceanographers have been able to demonstrate is that sea level uh, all along that coastline rose 500 feet and arose over the course of only a few centuries. And uh, that has now been uh, carbon-14 dated as about 12,000 years ago. Uh, pardon me, 11,000 years ago. So 11,000 years ago, we have an accurate scientific date for when the Bering Land Bridge was broken, and we now have the Bering Strait, and the Bering Strait uh, was impassable literally for more than 10,000 years. In fact, uh, there's the Queen Charlotte Islands off of British Columbia, a rather large set of islands inhabited by the Haidi Indians, and those Indians were cut off for 10,500 years because there was this Hecate Strait, uh, which no boat could traverse. And likewise, the Bering Land Bridge uh, was so treacherous that no boat could traverse it. And actually, I think that was part of God's plan. That meant that the human beings that have migrated over the Bering Land Bridge and moved into North America couldn't come back. So it prevented the human species from repeating the mistakes of the pre-flood peoples. And I don't know if any of you here are from Australia, uh, but there was nice land bridges uh, joining the Australian uh, continent uh, with uh, southern Asia, or at least to such a degree that you could see land across the other side and take a boat over. And likewise, there is a bridge joining France and, uh, and uh, Britain uh, at that time. And so there was all these, uh, these pathways were all put into place for humanity to become globally occupied. And to make sure that humanity stayed globally occupied, uh, these bridges were broken. And then we had these treacherous, treacherous straits that would prevent people uh, from coming back to one place one time. Well, if you have Peleg living 11,000 years ago, and you've got Abraham living 4,000 years ago, and if the lifespans recorded in Genesis 11 are proportional to the passage of time, now I admit that's debatable, uh, but it's also a reasonable assumption to make. If that assumption holds up, you get a date for Noah that comes in around 30 to 35,000 years ago, and you get a date for Adam and Eve that comes in at about 50,000 years ago. But as you see here, I'm trying to be rather generous uh, with the error bars. I think it's more like 50,000 plus or minus 10, but I'm willing to make it as big as 50,000 plus or minus 20 simply because we got that assumption uh, about the passage of time. Uh, that may not be correct, but it's all we got to go with. Now, I noticed that one of the individuals speaking here is making the point that this is quite inconsistent with the most ancient Australians. And uh, what he is referring to, or will be referring to, is the fact that uh, we have a thermoluminescent date at one site in Australia that places the Aborigines at 60,000 years ago. Uh, but thermoluminescence is not the same as carbon-14 dating. It basically only gives you an upper limit. Uh, so the 60,000-year date for the most ancient Australians is simply 60,000 years or less. Now, if you're not familiar with thermoluminescence, um, one of the things I did with my boys when they're really young is I bought these phosphorescent stars, and I pasted them on their ceiling and put it up so they could have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Big Dipper pointing to the North Star. I figured if I put it in their bedroom, and they ever get lost, they'll know which direction north is, that they can see the stars. But it also had an interesting application in that I would put them to bed, and uh, then they would turn the light on and read. And uh, so in order to make sure that uh, their bedtime was obeyed, uh, these stars served a second purpose, because they'd hear me coming down the stairs, and they quickly turn the light off, but the stars would be glowing. So I knew exactly what they were doing. <laughs> In fact, I could look at how bright those stars were and figure out how much time had been traversed since they turned the light off. Well, that's basically thermoluminescence dating. However, it's why this only gives you an upper limit 
is that you're assuming full illumination. You know, what if you have a lower watch?